Okay, we're live on Facebook. And live on Zoom, we've got about 87 people in the room right now. Welcome to the Virtual Lens Summit. My name is Michael Kerner with Kerner Camera, and this is actually our 16th Virtual Lens Summit, which is pretty fun. We've done them almost every Friday. We're going to start uh, spacing that out a little bit this August and September to every other Friday or every third Friday. <clears throat> um, you can see in the 100th anniversary of American Cinematographer Magazine that we have an ad there that says <laughs> Virtual Lens Summit Fridays, uh, Pacific Daylight Time. So uh, tune in on Fridays, not all Fridays, but a lot of Fridays. Anyway, we're really happy to have uh, Zero Optic with us today, Alex Nelson who's uh, been one of the companies leading the charge in rehousing vintage lenses, which is super exciting. Um, it's uh, definitely extremely, extremely popular and it's bringing a lot of lenses with character to the masses. Um, some of them are expensive and some of them aren't so expensive. So um, let's uh, go ahead and take it away, Alex. Thanks so much. Um, and thank you so much, Michael, for, for having me. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a really cool way to stand in for the, uh, the in-person Lens Summit, because I mean, I've enjoyed exhibiting the last couple of years with that and, and sort of heartbroken to see that it, you know, that would have to get pushed. A lot of trade shows would have to get pushed or canceled this year. Yeah, it's um, unfortunate, but yeah. this is a pretty incredible way to reach a lot of people, that's for sure. Yeah, and honestly, this is um, maybe even a way to, to reach more people because, you know, you can only have so many one-on-one -on -one conversations in person, but this sort of, you know, manifestly allows you to, to talk to a lot of people simultaneously. Yeah, um, I'm going to make you a co-host. I need to do that. Okay. So now you'll have a control over the screen. Okay, sorry oh, about that. Excellent. Okay, so yeah, so... Um, I guess where I, I figured I'd start is um, sort of just what makes us different from other rehousing companies. It's a, it's a question we get a lot. Um, and I think generally what people are asking is, you know, what makes our stuff mechanically different or what's, you know, why, why should our stuff be maybe a little expensive or, um, or take a certain amount of time. But given the venue that, uh, we have here, I figured I'd sort of take the long way around to, to that answer and just sort of go through um, my sort of like personal history and, and the company's history, um, because I think that will explain just how we are sort of separate philosophically from a lot of other rehousing companies. Um, because we're sort of glass agnostic, um, I don't really have a PowerPoint with a lot of MTF charts or bokeh comparisons or um, stills to share. It's, it's mostly about sort of our approach to rehousing, uh, both mechanically and aesthetically. Um, so let me bring that up. So can everyone see that? Um, so I actually, I'm not a formally trained mechanical engineer. Um, I studied cinematography. I went to film school. Um, imagined that I would actually become a cinematographer. Uh, so when I graduated, I worked at rental houses. Um, I interned at Panavision New York. Um, I was actually, I took the Union AC exam in New York, which is, uh, sort of a, a fun backdoor into the union and, and worked as a, a camera assistant. Um, and it was only uh, when I moved to LA that I started doing product design in earnest. Um, when I was still uh, just a prep tech in New York, I had a, a really keen sort of interest in just building stuff. And so um, 3D printing was starting to become more readily and widely available. Um, I was just really fascinated by sort of the mechanical aspects of the different film gear that I was dealing with um, as a prep tech and, and as a camera assistant. And so this is a, a 3D printed 
functional gear head that I made. Um, it, it tilts, it pans, it even has a sliding dovetail that will take a, a quarter 20 screw. Um, and so it was, it was always sort of this compulsion of mine to, to take apart the, the gear that I was working with and see how it worked and see if I could replicate it. Um, and one of the rental houses I worked at was uh, TCS. And while I worked there, they ended up buying a CNC milling machine. So I, I taught myself scratch. It was months of me watching YouTube videos and trying stuff and breaking stuff. Um, but one of the very first projects I, I attempted on my own uh, was this monstrosity, which was a very, very early attempt at sort of not even just lens rehousing, but also modifying optics. Um, this was pre-metabone speed booster days. Um, but I knew that if I had an achromatic doublet behind some really cool vintage uh, large format glass, that I could compress the image circle down and make it a faster lens and make it something that nobody else had. Um, and so what you see there is the doublet behind uh, a very old Cook large format lens. Um, each component that you see here, I turned by hand on a very, very old South Bend lathe uh, and then put on the CNC mill to do things like the, the PL tabs and the, the screw holes and things like that. Um, and so this, is, this was essentially the genesis of zero optic back when I was still working as a prep tech at, at TCS. Um, after, after working there, I moved out to Los Angeles and started working for Duplos Lenses, doing um, product design and mount conversions and um, basically anything that had to be done from scratch that wasn't a, a service job. Um, this was one of the, I think, the more fun projects. This was a, a fisheye lens that we built for, uh, for VR use. Um, Anything basically that, that allowed me to, to play with different shapes was, was a favorite of mine. Um, I'm really grateful that Matt Duclos has such a, an interest in uh, taking on weird and unusual projects because it, it meant that there was a lot of sort of fertile ground to, to explore what you could do with both the mechanical design and the, the industrial design of different lenses. Um, and obviously most stuff that gets built has to have, you know, 32 pitch gears and has to have you know, a lot of concessions to just the way camera assistants work. But every once in a while, there's a, a fun, fun piece like this where you just get to have fun with it and play with weird shapes and, um, and imagine new ways that people could, could use it. The, uh, the ring on the bottom that you see with those little sort of cutouts was, uh, that was the aperture scale because it didn't, it, it, because it was being used in a very specific way for VR capture, it didn't need a gear, it didn't need um, engravings on the smart and dumb side. So that, that sort of uh, experimentation is, is something that has always really grabbed me. And it's something that I wanted to make sure stays um, a really central sort of component to zero optic, that we're not just the North American rehousing company, we're not just some offshoot of, you know, TLS or PNS Technic, but that we have a very clear sort of interest in like weird creative projects that, that most people would probably say no to. Um, and that, that definitely started during my time at, at uh, Duclos. Um, the first project we had was uh, a 35 millimeter PL mounted pinhole lens. Um, it was something that just wasn't available. There were, there were no purpose-built pinhole lenses for cinematography, and it was something I personally wanted to shoot with. It was something I had experimented with uh, as a prep tech in New York and um, shot some early tests when the Red Epic first, first came out because that was capable of shooting almost 13,000 ISO. Um, and so you could actually shoot full 24-frame video with what is effectively a, an F-175 you know, lens. Um, most of the stuff you see though on, on Vimeo or YouTube or people are playing with shooting pinhole lenses for cinema, 
it's it's this very sort of crude DIY thing where you know you you punch a hole in aluminum foil and there's really no precision to it. So I wanted to see if you took the same sort of precision and um, attention to detail that gets applied to cinema lenses and and brought that to something as simple and straightforward as a pinhole, what would it look like and and would people actually be interested in it? So. The, uh, the kit actually came with three interchangeable pinholes. You see them sort of stacked up there on the, on the table. Um, five microns. So the diameter was extraordinarily precise. Um, you had F87.5, F175, and F350. Um, there is no focus. It's, it's fixed focus. Uh, and you basically have to trade off how sharp you want the lens versus uh, what your exposure has to be. So more exposure means your, your image will be a little bit softer, or if you can really crank the ISO up, then you can get a reasonably sharp image. I think a, an image that would surprise most people. Um, so that was sort of our inaugural project uh, while I was still at Duclos. Um, and took a, a few sort of it was also an experiment to see if you took some some sexy shots of uh, of a product as simple as a pinhole, if that would if that would get people's attention, and it it definitely did. Um, in case you're curious what it looks like, that's me at Cinegear, I think uh, two or three years ago. Um, depending on the OLPF in front of your sensor, if you flare it with the sun, you can get some really wild. Uh, sort of flare patterns that you wouldn't be able to get with anything else. Um, but you can also see, this is, I think, probably F-175. You can actually read text. You know, it's, it's not as blurry and sort of amorphous as, as I think a lot of people imagine for a pinhole lens. Um, so this was something I was just building basically in my spare time, nights and weekends. This was the the very first batch to be to be built and shipped. Uh, we did, um, I think it was about twenty of them. Duclos sold half of that batch, and the rest got sold uh, through a pretty simple and straightforward website that I put up. Um, and it was always interesting because there were rental houses or there were sort of individuals who had no idea what to do with this. Um, but it was really gratifying because every now and again, I would get a, an email or a message from someone who saw this project and, and it just excited them and it, it, it created all of these ideas in their head for stuff that they could shoot. And those are the people I really wanted to reach out to. And, and um, that's the kind of client base that I wanted to build. It's the people who saw really unusual lenses and and just you know sort of exploded with with possibilities that they could they could bring that onto a, a set with. Um, so the next project was original Baltars. Um, I I really wanted to get into lens rehousing um, uh, since since I was a prep tech in New York, and working at Duclos gave me a lot of sort of exposure to the way different companies dealt with mechanical challenges and and dealt with um, you know something as simple as just turning rotation into linear motion because you have to move optics back and forth to get focus um, and there are a lot of different ways to skin that cat um, and so I started experimenting with uh, cam focus and building an iris linkage from scratch um, and this was this was the initial design which was uh, a pretty direct ripoff of, of the S4 sort of aesthetic with that rounded off uh, focus witness and it had a 110 front and it was it was rather clunky and unwieldy but at the time clunky and unwieldy was very much a stylistic shorthand for cinema lens you know that that was when um, CP2s were really big um, a lot of the, the companies like Zeiss and Canon were, were coming out with essentially rehouse still lenses, you know, stuff from their consumer lines and their way of making it sort of lending legitimacy to those projects was to just make them big. You know, if you put a 114 front and a PL mount on it, it's suddenly, you know, a real cinema lens where if you made it too small, then it still looked like a, 
a, a toy basically. Um, and so this went through a few iterations, uh, considered doing silver, which was not yet all the rage at the time. Um, I also clearly was ignoring that you had to get uh, a focus and an iris motor next to each other. So I, I crammed those two gears right on top of each other. Um, but it was a, a valuable starting point because just working with, um, with machine shops and, and getting this sort of thing figured out and built took a lot of um, just experiment with how to suss out. And so even though the first prototype technically did what it was supposed to, it was pretty clear there, was, there were a lot of issues that needed to be solved before this could be um, a, a sellable product. Um, but that was the that was the final final build. Um, so it it had a, a look to it, but it wasn't it wasn't very graceful. We'll say um, here it is on its maiden voyage with uh, my friend Chris Mawson, I think on a shampoo commercial. Um, this was the only the only lens I uh, built was sorry. Um, the only focal length I bothered to build was a 50 millimeter ball tar. Um, and uh, it was, it, it was a little dicey to say the least. Um, and so we put on a couple jobs. This was a, a watch commercial, um, but Basically, the, the universal feedback was it needed to be smaller, it needed to be smoother. Like a lot of what people were sort of after was um, that like master prime feel where you can, you can really um, loosely sort of like rack back and forth. And so I went back to the drawing board. Was this still a side project at this time or were you uh, this still was working at Duke, Duke Close? Still working at Duclos, um, and I'm I'm incredibly grateful because uh, Paul and Matt were they, they gave this project their blessing. Um, this was something I I was doing. I, I would basically uh, spend all day at Duclos. I would come home. I'd get uh, a latte from the Starbucks near my apartment, and then spend the next like four or five hours designing and and uh, trying to get this figured out. Um, and so. It, ended up with something much, much smaller. This is, this is basically where uh, I landed on, it ought to be a 95 front if possible. Um, it just, it, it, it felt like a challenge worth, worth meeting. Um, it took a lot of doing though. So this was sort of the evolution. This is a cross section of what the 25 ball tar looks like inside. And you can see it's sort of folded in on itself because if you just do a really straightforward mechanical design, you have to make it enormous. But if you can start sort of making it into optomechanical origami, um, suddenly you can fit a very, very wide lens into a very small package. Um, and the 25 was absolutely the worst case scenario. Uh, it, it sits incredibly close to the film plane, which is what that uh, orange rectangle is all the way to the right. Um, but it's also a 25 millimeter lens. So you've got to be able to get it basically deep inside the PL mount, not vignette. And you still have to be able to control the iris as it travels. You still have to have, you know, reasonable close focus, which was about a foot. Um, and so that sort of began my uh, obsession essentially with trying to make all of our stuff as clever inside as possible. So it's not just getting, you know, from point A to point B. It's not just, you know, can we put a PL mount around this vintage lens, but, you know, how tiny, how light, how, you know, elegant can we make the design so that what you end up with is actually, you know, it's, it's something of an achievement, essentially, um, even if nobody sees inside, really. Um, and so this was the, the full set. Uh, it was um, eight focal lengths from 25 to 152. Uh, eventually, we added the Ingenue 18.5, which was sort of the contemporary wide-angle lens at the time. Um, but that was our inaugural inaugural rehousing project, and that was that's what sort of launched Zero Optic as a rehousing company, and um, basically gave enough sort of uh, 
validation to the the whole enterprise that um, it was worth exploring new and, and other projects. Um, John Fowler was very kind and, and did a write up for us or about us rather um, in 2017, and and that helped get the word out that you know from from there people who uh, own rental houses or DPs who wouldn't otherwise sort of be following me on Instagram or on social media um, started reaching out and and trying to get more information about these and find out if we were doing any other projects um, at the time. Grows and maybe soup um, the that as a market hadn't really exploded yet. Um, but I'm getting a little see. bit of cut out, Alex. There's a little bit of cut out with your mic. I don't know if it's your mic oh. or the connection. It might be the connection. Okay, I just thought um, I'd try you. Should I backtrack a little bit? I think it's okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, then uh, we participated in uh, the ASC's first Cinema Lens Day, where they presented, um, it was a combination of rehousing companies and uh, major manufacturers for, for ASC members to um, look at and test and, and ask questions. And so we were, this was basically all I had to show. It was, it was that really clumsy sort of uh, silver prototype. Uh, there was a 3D printed mock-up. There were some sort of components. I think I might've had one or two finished builds but it was a, a very modest sort of selection. And I was next to TLS and PNS Technic um, and a few other companies that were, you know, that had full product lines to offer. So it was, it was a, a little bit humbling, but uh, we got to, I, I got to talk to more people and find out sort of what projects, you know, ASC members were interested in seeing and, um, and, and get feedback on sort of the ergonomics and, and what people wanted from, from housings. Um, and yeah, so that this was the first batch being built uh, literally at my kitchen table. Because um, even after I left Duclos, I didn't really have a space. I was just working out of my apartment by myself. I would uh, drive to machine shops, pick up parts, come back, start building stuff, answer client emails, and and try and fit in sort of design time around that. So I, I had all of these uh, illusions about working for myself being all about picking my own schedule and, and having more freedom. And that was absolutely not the case. Um, it was, it, it any, seems like a lot of uh, lens people start out in their kitchen. I think so. I think, I think it's sort of, uh, it's a rite of passage, right? You, if, if you can do it in a kitchen, then once you have a proper facility, it's just that much easier. <laughs> So this is what the, the final ones look like. Um, one of the, the big sort of points for me was the aesthetic design and the anodizing. Because at the time, uh, most of the, the rehousing options out there were very practical. Um, I think a lot of companies that offer rehousing started out as like lens service shops, um, staffed and owned primarily by engineers. And I come from, uh, you know, an art school background. Both my parents are architects, and so I, I wanted very much to have to sort of plant my flag in terms of the cosmetic design of our, our stuff. It, it needed to look like a proper cinema lens, not just achieve, you know, the mechanical requirements that cinema lenses have. Um, so to that point, anodizing was super, super important. It took a very long time to find the, the anodizing vendor that we have that could actually replicate the kind of texture and finish that you see uh, in Zeiss lenses and Leica lenses, you know, and stuff that comes from major factories. Because if you just go to an anodizing shop, you know, uh, around LA, for example, they don't offer that kind of finish. They're, they're not used to cosmetic finishes. They're used to building stuff for Lockheed Martin or, you know, um, companies that, that just sort of need corrosion resistance, but nothing nothing that looks pretty essentially. Um, and so that was, that was a, a massive, massive interest for me. Um, one of the, the very first sort of projects after the Baltars was actually for 65 format, uh, a DP who I'd been um, helping with his 65 kit 
came to me and, and wanted to know if there was any way we could build uh, super fast primes for 65 because he, he was shooting this long form nonfiction project with, uh, with these Mitchell Fry's cameras. He had an IMAX body, um, but it was all nonfiction and shooting in the bitter, bitter cold of Alberta, Canada. And so he needed something that was a little more robust and, and better sort of mechanically than the quasi rehoused Hasselblad lenses he, he already had in his kit. So we ended up building a 35 T15 and a 50 millimeter T15. And these must be the first sort of super speeds for that format because um, most of what you see for these cameras is it's medium format glass, it's stuff that maybe maxes out at like a F2, F2.8. Um, we had to physically modify the body in order to accommodate these because the, the optics sat so deep into the camera. Um, the mount was really unusual. So we had, to, we had to bore out the lens cavity of the camera and, and build these sliding focus scales so that he could also recalibrate infinity in the field with essentially gloves on because it was, the, the temperature swings under his shooting conditions were, were pretty extreme. Um, what, what did you say the uh, um, uh, donor lenses are or the original lenses? Um, it, was, it was a variety of sort of still photo glass that we, we did some testing on and found. So it was stuff that was originally designed for full frame, um, but the, the image circle was big enough to cover five per 65. Um, I, I wish I had some test stills because even just through the viewfinder, the 35 looks insane. It, a 35 on, on, on that kind of format gives you an incredibly wide field of view. Um, so when you shoot that with a you know, wide open at T15, it, it gives you this epic sort of medium format uh, look. It, it, if anything, it actually it looks a little bit anamorphic. Um, then we, we continued with sort of the, the weird projects. We, we did this 50 millimeter um, F.95 lens that Anjanu made uh, between 1960 and 1980. Um, it was originally built for surveillance purposes, essentially. It was, it's, it was never sold to the public. It was this incredibly sort of unusual lens that, that predates the, uh, the famous Canon Dream lens. And we started building a collection of these for a client of ours in France. And I was talking to someone at Ingenue and they said, you know, we actually, we, we have some of these still at the factory. And so we were actually able to buy the last nine that Anjanu had basically new old stock. Um, we rehoused a total of 15 of these and, and just sold them as turnkey lenses. Um, it's something though, it, it took a lot of doing because we, we occasionally get emails about uh, doing more of these. There were some really um, precise modifications that had to be made to some of the optics. You have them just to fit inside a PL mount. And so after we did the initial batch of 15, it was just, that was it. The, there was, we didn't want to have to thread that needle anymore. Um, so if you, if you get a chance to rent these, there, there, are, there are a couple in LA, uh, there's one in Canada. Most of them found their way to Europe. Um, and then we started doing full frame stuff. So this was our, our sort of, first Nikon uh, housing. We started with the, the sort of famous, the legendary uh, 58 millimeter notch Nikkor. Um, it's a bit of an outlier when it comes to the Nikon lenses. It was designed essentially for Nikon to just flex their optical muscles. Um, they, they made it for astrophotography. So the idea is it works best when it is shot wide open at infinity which is not usually something you can say about most still lenses or, or most cinema lenses even. Um, typically you want to stop down a couple of stops to get the best performance out of a lens. But these, they had hand polished A spheres. They only made about a hundred of them each year during production. Um, and so where the average sort of like fast 50 from Nikon maybe cost five to $600, this one uh, goes for between three and 4,000. But it was such a such a beautiful piece of glass that we decided that should be sort of how we announced the, the Nikon project. 
Um, and so now we offer a complete range from 15 millimeters all the way through 135. Um, and again, sort of, you can see there, one of the, the big interests for me was paying homage to the original lenses and, and including, um, for example, like the, the iris witness ring, which is silver and has that straight knurling that sort of mimics the original Nikon AIS primes um, and, and throwing in, you know, Nikon yellow paint so that it's not just, um, it's not just some rote, you know, mechanical thing that gets you the image that you're looking for. It actually, it, it has a bit of a story to it. Um, the, the same client actually that we built the 65 primes, we ended up uh, doing some BNCR mounted version so that they could shoot Nikons on original Vista Vision bodies, which is sort of uh, the, that's kind of the genesis of Nikons being used for cinematography is they were used on a lot of Vista Vision bodies for visual effects works, for plates, um, for uh, stuff like Indian in the Cupboard where you had to do a lot of um, really hairy sort of like camera matching you needed as big a negative as possible and super 35 just couldn't satisfy that so we, we it was fun to bring it full circle and, and put like properly rebuilt nikons back on these kinds of bodies um we've also we've been doing some testing with uh alexa 65 and the nikons they actually cover as wide as 24 uh at 5k um and so uh, we actually, one of the lenses we built, uh, one of the knocks rather, worked on Joker, which was shot on Alexa 65, because it, it covers that insane sensor, but it also gets incredibly close focus, which is not something that you can say for a lot of, a lot of the primes that cover that format. It's our, our Nikon 15, uh, without the front of the housing, the, the dome of glass on that thing is, is absurd, but you get, um, you get some really pretty flares in a way that just doesn't compare to, or rather that you don't get from uh, the slightly faster rectilinear fisheye that they offer. Cause there's also a 14 2.8 that is just a little cleaner. It's a little more antiseptic. Um, and so this, this is really a, a fun one to play with and gives you an almost sort of uh, anamorphic distortion on the, on the sides and on, in the corners. Um, this is our Canon Dream Lens rehousing. The, the first batch of these were actually built specifically for Zack Snyder. Um, he had a Netflix feature that he shot last summer and had a series of these that he wanted to shoot with. Um, and there was a very short turnaround time. These, these had to be on set within a matter of like a month and a half. And so, um, he brought all the lenses to us. It was three of these Canon Dream lenses, three of the 35 f1.5s in that in that set, and he wanted to know if it was possible to rehouse these in a way that would make them usable for cinema. And the caveat was basically we could, but it had to be like an M mount. Um, PL just does not work with this sort of this sort of lens. These are vintage rangefinder lenses that sit incredibly close to the film plane. The optics are quite large in the front group for this lens. And the only way to, to make it work without any sort of question or, or having to prototype anything um, was to just go with a short flange depth mount. Um, so here's the 35. You can see the, the end mount a little bit better. And so we did 335s, 350s, and uh, he shot the whole thing on Monstro, mostly with the 50 wide open. Um, poor camera assistance on that. But it's a, we get a lot of questions about putting these into either PL or LPL mount. And sort of very early on in the project, we wanted to leave the door open for doing the full range of vintage rangefinder glass. So this set actually goes from 19 through 135. And you could shoehorn sort of some of these into a PL mount, um, but if you want to be able to, to put a proper like eight lens set together, M was sort of the best option. Um, and so this is a, a quick explanation or a quick sort of illustration of the optics for the Canon Dream Lens. You can see the, the front is enormous. And if you put PL mount on it, 
it, it conflicts pretty clearly. Um, you know, there are certain things you could do to maybe get there, but you wouldn't end up with a very robust sort of mechanical solution. And the rear element sticks way into the camera in a way that uh, a lot of just PL mounts don't accommodate. Um, sorry, the, the lens cavity on a PL mounted camera. Um, LPL doesn't get you too much more real estate, but M left a lot of room for us to get really good close focus, to have a really strong uh, iris linkage in there, and to, to make sure that in the time frame we had for this project, that we could build six of these lenses and get them to set and not worry about the body. And so we started filling out that, that set and building uh, 8,500, and now we're, we're looping back to the, the wides. Um, we also ended up doing a, a brass housing for, for Zach because he, he wanted a, a sort of vintage homage to the, the original brass housings that a lot of these lenses sported. It is extraordinarily heavy though for anyone who is contemplating asking about that. Um, here's a, a close up on, on one of our Leicas. Again, trying to sort of pay respect to the original aesthetic of uh, some of these manufacturers going out of our way to find paint that, that really closely matches um, you know, what Leica used or Canon or, uh, or Nikon so that there's a little bit more of a connection to the original glass than, than just um, what's inside. That's our 60 macro. Um, and then one of our, our really fun projects that's coming up uh, we, uh, we sort of, I think we've been teasing it a little bit on some of our Instagram Live stuff, um, but I wanted to sort of more formally announce it here is we are beginning to rehouse uh, Olympus OM glass, which is a really fun set because unlike most still photo companies, um, Olympus came at this with a very sort of cohesive approach. There was one designer behind the entire set rather than dealing with each focal length as a discrete product. And the entire set from 21 through 250 millimeters is an F2 with the weird exception of the 135. Um, so you have a very consistent set stop wise. You have a lot of focal lengths that other sets don't have, including 40, 60, 70. Um, and so you can build what are essentially full frame ultra primes. That's a, a really cool vintage character um, for a fraction of the price of a lot of the, the um, new products being, being released by major companies. Um, and it's one, one of the really cool things actually about these lenses, if you look at Olympus's original promotional literature, they actually made specific reference to cinematography. Um, they have a, a book that they put out at the time in the 80s that was all about their, their OM lenses. And they specifically talk about Nestor Almendros' work on Days of Heaven as sort of a jumping off point for, for where they were going in terms of image and sort of just the quality of their, their glass, which um, sort of, it's, it's, it's funny because, you know, if you look at Nikon or Leica or Canon, they would do maybe a fast 50, a fast 85, a fast 35, but they'd never, they never geared those lenses toward the same client. It was always, you know, a fast 85 is going to be for portrait photographers, a fast 35 might be for more like reportage. They don't have to match particularly well. They can maybe come out, you know, years apart. Um, so to find a set of vintage glass like this that actually feels like it was made for cinematographers is, is a fun discovery. I think. Um, that's going to that's gonna be a great set to, to start playing with when we, when we start shipping those in a few months. So that is that's sort of my overall presentation. Um, like I said, no, no MTF graphs, no sort of bokeh comparisons, um, but figured I'd, I'd, you know, open it up more to questions because we get a lot of different um, questions either on Instagram or by email about sourcing glass or, um, you know, vintage Zooms, for example. And so it's uh, figured I'd, I'd sort of deal with a lot of that stuff um, here because it, it tends to tends to come up about, especially like FDs and K35s and, and 
things like that. Um, let's see. Uh, Michael asked about how many sets of Baltars we've rehoused. I think at this point it's maybe oh, probably only about a dozen or so. Um, they're not especially expensive, but they are a little difficult to source. Um, there are a few focal lengths like 30 and 40 that uh, they, they just didn't make that many of them. Some of the like the 50, the 75, the 100 got used for a variety of different sort of industries. You're cutting out a little bit there, Alex. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, you can, the Bosch and Loam sold a lot of Baltars to like the scientific community, to the military. Um, and so we have pulled some of them out of like aerial reconnaissance rigs, out of microscope assemblies. Um, but some of the stuff that was maybe more specifically for cinematography, like the 30 and the 40 focal lengths, are just not that easy to come by. And those are the regular Baltars, not super Baltars, right? Right, those were, so the original Baltars came out in the late 30s. Um, they were designed for rack over cameras where you didn't have a reflex system. Um, the super Baltars came out in the 60s, uh, early to mid 60s. And they were one of the, the first sets that were um, built with a retrofocus design. So they were designed to sit further away from the film plane and allow uh, a reflex mirror to spin behind them, which is why with super Baltars, you see some inconsistencies from one focal length to the next because they were essentially experimenting with brand new technology where the original Baltars, even when they were designed, were operating on essentially an optical layout that had been um, pretty much proven for the last like 50 years, um, which is just a, it's a simple double Gauss arrangement. So from 25 to 100, they're just scaled up versions of one another. And then when you're uh, doing a project and somebody sends you a bunch of lenses, do you typically do them in batches? Like, okay, I've got all of these Canon FDs or whatever, all these Nikon lenses. I mean, it must be hard to gear up and switch directions when you have 10 different kinds of lenses that have 10 different ways to rehouse. Uh, so what we do is um, each, each set is, is built um, as a unit essentially. So, um, you know, if you send us a set of Nikons to rehouse, we'll build your set of Nikons all at once, um, which it's, it gets, you know, full sets out the door. Because we could do, say, like all of the 50s that we have in-house, and, and that would get a lot of 50s out the door, but no one would have a, a cohesive set. Um, but we have three different technicians building it in a given time. So one technician could be doing a set of Nikons, one could be doing Canon rangefinder glass, one could be doing like ours. Um, and we, we try to use as many um, sort of universal components in our lenses so that there isn't too much variation from one design to the next. Um, and it also, it gives us the ability, you know, if we find say a, a small design flaw or something we'd like to improve in a component, we can just run, you know, say a new cam follower and it can be swapped out in anything we've built going back to the, the original Baltars. How do you uh, source lenses? You know, how do you suggest for somebody that wants to get lenses rehoused? You know, I mean, there's stories in the past of, you know, people used to go through obituaries and look at a cinematographer that passed away. Then they'd go talk to the widow and say, hey, what's in the closet? I mean, you know, it sounds morbid and stuff, but that was pretty common practice. And I'm just wondering what, what do you suggest for trying to figure out how to find some good glass to uh, rehouse? Yeah, I mean, um, honestly, that sort of approach kind of uh, is still probably the best. Um, anything that is not eBay is probably going to give you a leg up. So if there is um, a camera shop near you where you can actually go and inspect the lens, um, that's going to be a really solid bet. Any instance where you can see the lens personally before you buy it is, is probably your best bet because obviously everyone is trolling eBay. Everyone is looking at, you know, KEH or use Photo Pro. Um, and so what you find on there tends to be stuff that um, either people are being sort of disingenuous about the, the quality and condition of the glass or 
what we've had, we've, we've started compiling lists of serial numbers that we've already rejected for clients because we'll see the same lens three times in a row from different people because it's a hard to find lens and, and everyone is, you know, essentially fishing in the same, same pond. Um, so if you can sort of get away from the obvious options and especially find places that have decent um, return policies or that maybe don't know about lens rehousing, that's, that's going to be your best bet. And if you can do that, if you can inspect stuff in person, bring an LED flashlight because it doesn't matter, you know, if you just sort of like hold it up to a window, that's not going to tell you much. But if you shine a powerful LED flashlight through the optics, that'll show you if there's fungus or haze or really bad scratches, death, which is also sort of the, the major shortcoming of eBay. Um, a lot of the photos show you how gorgeous, you know, the original housing looks, you know, that the paint is in really good condition and the metal hasn't been scratched, but you can't see what the optics look like inside. Thanks. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, so someone asked about uh, F-stops and T-stops, um, which has been sort of a, that, that's, that's been a bit of a crusade for me is, is honest T-stopping. Um, because we, so we, we built our own T-stop bench. We have our own sort of um, system for, for making sure that it is as accurate and, um, and uh, honest as possible, which usually doesn't correspond to people's hopes for the T-stops on some of these lenses. Um, we found, for example, with either K35s or FDs, the 55 1.2, it has very bad yellowing will T-stop as a 1.5 or a 1.6, which that's not, that's not that sexy. It's a, you know, it's an F1.2. People are hoping that it's at least a T1.3. Um, but it's always been sort of my thought that, you know, if, if you're genuinely using T-stops for exposure, you need, you need the real information. You know, it, it doesn't help to, to give you sort of optimistic or, or wishful T-stops or, or to fudge it to something that, um, that maybe is more marketable because, you know, ultimately your exposure will be inconsistent across uh, a shoot. And we see it's, it's not as simple as just adding 0.1 to the F-stop, which is what um, some sort of, some rehousing companies do is they'll look at the F-stop. It's a F2, for example, and they'll say, great, we'll just call it a T2.1. We'll sort of like shift everything that much on the scale. Um, it depends on the focal length. It could end up being a T22, a T3. Um, and it's, so it's, it's been a little bit of a battle to, to justify that to, to clients who um, feel that that might put their lenses at a disadvantage when it comes to rentals. We had a, uh, a couple sets of Cook Speed Pancros rehoused and the 75 millimeters are notorious for being yellow, right? Yeah. So when we had them rehoused uh, by TLS, the T2.3 turned into a T2.8, you know, and that's <laughs> on the scale. And so um, in talking with Gerhard Bear over at PS Technique, he said, oh, you know, I saw him in um, Camera Mosh in Poland. He said, oh, send that. I can fix that, you know. So he took it. He sent it to him. He took the doublet apart and it was the glue, apparently, part of the reason. And when it came back, it was actually faster. He said they put it on the bench three times and it turned out to be a T2 instead of a 2.3. Yeah, which is, that's, that's sort of the fun thing is, uh, especially with the really vintage stuff like the Pancros or the original Baltars, optically, they're not very complex. They're only like six pieces of glass in there. And so even though it, they have incredibly primitive coatings, um, you just don't have that many optical surfaces to rob you of light. So we've, we found the same thing with some of the, the late batch original Baltars if they're clean and the coating is in really good condition, yeah, they come in faster than they're engraved, um, or faster than, rather than Bosch and Lohm engraves them. Um, because I think they were doing everything with a slide rule and graph paper. And so they, they calculated this is what the T-stop ought to be, um, but they end up performing a lot better. Where uh, we've actually, we've also found with uncoated original Baltars, um, they do substantially worse. So the, the very first batches of original Baltars had no coatings on any surface and they're engraved. They're supposed to be a T25. They routinely come in at like a 2.8. Um, and so 
unless you decement everything, coat every surface and put it back together. That's, that's just sort of what you have to live with. Yeah, there's some more questions here. Um, yeah. From David Kellerman, he said, did the coatings vary a lot within a series? Or are they rather consistent? And I'm not sure, David, if you're talking about the Nikons. And he also asks uh, about, have you done recodings? Um, so we have done recodings to match lenses, um, primarily with the really vintage stuff. Um, stuff from the 30s, 40s, 50s, early 60s. It's, it's not that difficult to, to match um, the actual sort of like coding recipe and composition. When it comes to sort of more modern stuff, especially multi-coded, you know, still photo lenses, in the like mid to late 60s, a lot of companies started developing their own multi-coding recipes. And so it can be much harder to um, both to replicate that and, and to apply that to glass that you don't, you don't have drawings for, because you need to know what the glass type is, you need to know what the refractive index is in order to make sure that the multi-coding is applied properly. Um, so that's a little bit trickier. Uh, you see with a lot of still glass because they were dealing with individual focal lengths as discrete products and not as part of a cohesive set, you do get coding variations. Um, so we get a lot of questions, for example, about like color matching Nikons or like R's or Canon FDs, which sort of presupposes that all you have to do is find the ones that match. Um, but Canon didn't necessarily approach it that way. They just said, you know, we've, here's a, you know, 28 2.0 that, performs reasonably well, it doesn't need to, to have the same color cast or flares or, or performance as the 24 1.4. Um, and so when you're dealing with vintage still glass, you sort of have to accept that there is going to be a, a certain degree of variation uh, in, in flare performance and in color temperature. It's sort of interesting. We were, uh, Alex and I were talking earlier about people wanting to have these unicorn lenses like they have a certain set and it's their set and certain rental houses will have a set of lenses that's super unique, which is great for an owner operator maybe, or a specific project, but it really pigeonholes the uh, cinematographer down the road because there's only one set of those or a couple set of sets of those in your country to source for your commercial or your movie. Um, so it's just sort of interesting how you have these super custom lenses coming out that might be, you might do a special project, tune them for somebody, and then that DP is gonna demand those lenses on their next job, which is uh, not very practical. <laughs> it used to be easy, there were like three or four lenses. You, you have super speeds, ultra primes, cook S fours, whatever, master primes. Now there's a room of lenses. Yeah, and, and a lot of rental houses are, are uh, very eager to either have stuff that, you know, their competition doesn't, um, you know, very rare or unusual glass, or sort of the, the same way we have to battle um, folks about T-stops. We also have requests every now and again to just rebadge, you know, a set of Nikons or Canons or whatever, as if it were a, a unique product uh, without any modification. Um, and so that's, that's something we're, we're not, we're not open to, you know, it, it'd be one thing if, um, you know, if it is a set of lenses, for example, that have, you know, every focal length is from a different manufacturer and you, you really can't pin it to one, one origin. But, you know, if you take a set of off the shelf Nikons and say, can you call these, you know, my, my brand new dragon primes, so I'm going to tell everybody that I've got, I've got glass that no one else has. Um, it's not something we'd like to participate in. Let's <laughs> uh, see, got some questions about T-stops. We, we do measure T-stops for each, um, each individual lens. So every lens gets put on the T-stop bench and we mark full stops and third stops for that lens. So um, there are no like off the shelf scales that we make, um, everything, the focus scales, the, the iris scales are all done per lens, which is, is partially why um, it just, it, you know, there's sort of a, a certain amount of time that, that each set is going to take to build because you have to, uh, you just have to leave room for that kind of precision. And especially, you know, 
we, we offer, for example, um, interchangeable focus scales, so metric and imperial, or sometimes it'll be mixed metric and imperial on one scale. Uh, that's that's a lot of marks that have to be gotten, you know, manually by hand. How do you, uh, there's a question from John Fowler that I was thinking as well, yeah, he said T-stop is, how do you measure uh, the T-stops? Uh, so we built our own T-stop bench, actually. Um, there, when I started Zero Optic, there were really no commercial options. Uh, I don't think the Kish system was available unless you, you know, bought it secondhand from somebody. Um, Zeiss has a system that I think Able uses that uses uh, has like a big integrating sphere and reads out in EV units. Uh, um, so cutting out for it. Um, so I built my own system that. Uh, I, I have to build my own system that, that uses um, an extraordinarily sensitive light meter that can read to three decimal places so that we could we could measure all the way down to like, you know, T22 or 32 with um, an incredible amount of precision still. And, and we developed uh, an app that basically interfaces with that light meter and gives you all the full stops and third stops that you have to hit as you're building lenses. So it's it's also we we had to build our own optical bench as well so that we could get uh, we could do centering calibration we could do close focus marks very precisely um, and and also use it as a collimator so a lot of our test equipment had to be built from the ground up. What kind of projector do you, do you use? Right now we use the um, the the Kish uh, the sort of little baby uh, I think it's called the lens checker. Um, because it's one of the things I really liked about that is the, the reticle is fixed. Um, we don't really have a lot of use for a moving reticle. If, if anything, that can introduce sort of problems and inconsistencies in the build. And so it's just a platform for building lenses. Um, that was a really, really solid option. There's a question uh, from Chris Janik that says, uh, what, uh, what are the, some of the common mistakes that folks make when building a donor lens set? Um, the biggest one is probably assuming, or <laughs> the biggest one is probably trusting eBay sellers. Um, you know, everything, everything on there is, is listed as excellent and mint plus plus, and it's, it's most often just nonsense. Um, and so more than anything else, I, I, I think um, being very critical and, and testing stuff and checking stuff when it comes in is, is the big thing. Because other than that, we, we can't really offer a lot of advice in terms of um, like how to put together the best set because so much of it is open to personal taste. You know, if you find coding variations um, in a set or, you know, maybe one focal length, you know, just outperforms the rest of the, the set from that manufacturer, um, it's not really our business to weigh in on, on what you should put in, in the set you want to build. But at the very least, it should be in good condition and it shouldn't have fungus in it. Um, so that, that's probably the, the biggest issue. And, and probably, you know, test everything ahead of time. You know, it, it, I hate to ship something to someone and then they find out that, you know, maybe it could have been better color match. They could have had more, um, more versions of a lens for, from the same production year. It's, uh, the sets come up a few times either, mostly with Canon FDs, because you've got, you know, SSC coatings, you've got NFDs, you have Ls. There's a lot of sort of variation within the umbrella of, uh, of Canon FDs. Um, and so, you know, it, I say do, do all the research, do all the testing that you can before, before you send the set in. Any other questions? Got to be some more questions out there. What, uh, Alex, what's your favorite, uh, Aesthetically, what's your favorite lens and what's your favorite lens to work on? Two questions. Uh, <laughs> aesthetically, 
in terms of image, um, I'm, I'm a sucker for, for some of the super wides. The, the Nikon 15 is just really cool. Um, and it's also, uh, I, I really like shooting architecture. And a lens like that really lends itself to that sort of dramatic perspective and converging lines. So um, I think that's probably one of my favorites. It's also, it's one of the coolest looking lenses we, we make. Um, the, that front element is just an absurd piece of glass. Um, that said, it is probably my least favorite. You got muted. You dropped off. Yeah, the, the, the 15 is, is probably my favorite to shoot with and my, my least favorite to build. Um, the, the rehousing for that is, is a, a treacherous mechanical design just because you have this colossal front group and this little cut out again oh, alex sorry <laughs> um let's see i think my favorite to build is probably um i don't know, the, i think the 20 millimeter nikon to be honest uh the, I'm, I'm just really proud of the design of that, and, and it's something that should be really difficult, but um, it's honestly one of the fastest lenses that we could put together, even though it's a, a wide floating design, and it's, it's essentially a pancake. It's, it's about this size. Um, and this is, this is the Nikon 24, but they, they have the same housing. They're both floating, and I'm uh, just <laughs> I'm really proud of fitting all of that into such a tiny package. With um, these are basic, all of your lenses are cam follower based, correct? Design. That's right. And yeah. so with cases, you suggest to have them on their side, horizontal, instead of vertical? Um, most of our clients have them vertical. It's, we, we don't actually have a preference, really. Um, the idea has been to design these to take uh, all the abuse that, that production work can dish out. So. Um, one of the very first batches of, of knocked die cores that we built, we actually had a client, he came, he picked his, his lens up from the office and two hours later called us and said that he dropped it on the sidewalk. Ouch. Um, yeah, but the, luckily the glass was in good shape. So he, he brought it back and it was a, a 15 minute repair. We just had to swap out one component and it was back out on the- Oh wow, that's impressive. Yeah, so the, the idea like, you know, having worked as a camera assistant, having worked at rental houses um, and having seen the kind of horrific things that, that come through do close for repair. Um, I, I know what sort of misery is in store for these lenses. And we, we try to build everything with that in mind rather than something that needs to be babied. And they're uh, pretty easy to work on as well, aren't they? Yeah, that's the idea. Um, again, you know, I, I know what, what a lot of service technicians have to go through. So the idea is to make it as intuitive as possible, even if you haven't opened one of our lenses before. Um, we made it specifically so you can swap focus scales in about five minutes per lens. Um, you know, if, if you feel like something is maybe loose inside, there are only a couple of screws that you have to take out to get into to really critical areas. Um, so the idea is it, it should have as little downtime on the bench as possible. Great. And you're doing K35s as well now? We're doing K35s as well. It was. Um, because we were already doing FDs, and there is the, the K35s are not a strict uh, offshoot of, of FDs, but there's a lot of shared DNA. So we were able to, to accommodate the 24, the 55, and the 85 really easily. And then it was just a matter of the 35 and the two different 18s. Um, so it, it just made a lot of sense. Um, and it's something, again, I, I like a challenge. And I wanted to see if we could fit some of these, like the, the Fast 18 is, is quite large. I wanted to see if we could still keep it in the 95 front and, and we have. Nice. Yeah. Hey, um, Alex, I had a question. Hi, Max here from Ukraine. Right. Um, great presentation, very inspirational. I'm, uh, sort of stepping into the rehousing game uh, myself right now, just going through some of the early stages of what you were describing, trying to find, you know, people who would do decent anodizing that will look great and, you know, machinists that uh, uh, like great tolerances and all that. So it was like really, really inspirational. So thank you for, uh, for 
for, for telling the story. And Michael, as always, thank you for hosting. Uh, this was great. Um, I had a question about the, the, the camp followers as well. I think on one of the cross sections, I've seen like this wedge shaped um, cavity. So I'm assuming it's something like a kind of a similar to what Cook does with their S uh, line. Um, so I had a question, how do you um, tackle the lost motion backlash uh, and all those aspects that uh, are like the, the downsides of the uh, cam base design? And uh, how do you design the cam so the focus marks are like spaced evenly, uh, you know, so you don't have like too much of a, a throw in a certain portions of uh, Right. Focusing range. Um, the the first question is hard to answer because we, it's we essentially it it comes down to tolerancing and it comes down to very. You cut out again, Alex. Sorry. Um, it, yeah, it dropped out, didn't it? Um, the, as far as like backlash goes, um, and and lost motion. Um, we just have a, a lot of very sort of precise techniques and procedures while we're building lenses that, that um, chase out any sort of lost motion. So it, it can't really be boiled down to one particular feature. Um, but yeah, we, we use a, a similar uh, cam system to Cook or TLS with our own sort of um, take on it to, to allow for adjustments that, that you know, remove slop or, or remove play. Um, uh, yeah, and then I mean the the barrel cams that, that took a while to to sort out as far as manufacturing goes. It was essentially just a lot of experimentation and a lot of working side by side um, with uh, some very talented machinists to to get the the process just right so that there there aren't any bumps. There are you know the finish is perfect and and you can get um, very clean scales with with good separation in between marks. Do you dream and count cam followers to go to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely, I definitely have those moments where I wake up and in, uh, in the middle of the night and realize how I'm going to solve some particular mechanical challenge. Yeah, it's honestly that one of the um, sort of frustrating things with it is the because I'm I'm so obsessed with trying to make stuff as small as possible. Like it, it often requires just like moments of inspiration to get through a mechanical challenge where if we had larger like 110 or 114 fronts we could probably chuck any optic we wanted into a housing and, and be done with it relatively quickly um but when you're trying to get you know something like like this designed and built um you really have to bang your head against the wall for for a week or so before the the answer comes so yeah it's, it's a bit of an obsession there's a, a question from eric macy here that talks about um how many sets of the Olympus, Olympus, Olympus lenses do you plan to uh, start doing? Um, so we, we did sort of let this slip to a few people um, before. So we have, at the moment, we have 15 or 16 sets sort of on the shelf waiting to be done from, from various rental houses and, um, and owner operators. Um, so I imagine we'll probably do like a, an initial batch of like, 20 sets and and see um see what the demand looks like and like i said we we try to use as many common components from from other housings as possible so the the startup time is pretty minimal and, and if we run out of parts then um then we can re-up pretty easily would you describe uh the look of the olympics olympus lenses are they like vintagey flary or warm or cold or contrasty they're um, they're, they're kind of warm. So they've got uh, a really pretty like orange coating. So you don't, you don't get that sort of antiseptic green that you see in a lot of modern still glass. Um, but they also don't lean purple either. So you get these sort of like fiery kind of like red orange flares. Um, and the nice thing with those is they weren't necessarily trying to, to win any like technical awards with these. So they have a really nice sort of like fall up in the corners. They have um, a very gentle kind of look to them. Um, it, it sort of reminds me, Leica used to have this saying about their glass, which was it's, it's not about um, lens charts, it's about the photos. And that's very much sort of the philosophy that Olympus had was, you know, it's about 
making really beautiful images, not just maximizing MTF across the frame. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll put some stills up on our Instagram that were, that were taken with the Olympus Prime so that people can take a look for themselves and see what the, the flares and the, the corner characteristics look like. David Killerman had a question about doing zooms. Yes. Um, so that's something we're, we're, not, uh, we're not really entertaining at the moment, um, especially as it relates to still photo zooms. Um, because a lot of still zooms, with some notable exceptions, are not particularly well suited to adaptation for cinema. Um, they're not far focal, so they don't, they don't hold focus through the range. Um, they, you know, the, the mechanical design sort of lends itself better to, um, to the way still photographers work versus cinematographers. And so you end up having to create some incredible cut out for a second, right? Um, you have to end up creating some very complex mechanical designs to take, you know, what is essentially a poorly performing still photo lens and make it cinema ready. And it, it, it tends to sort of um, be more than maybe the lens is worth. You know, if, if you're taking a $600 Vivitar zoom, for example, that might be quite pretty. It, it could be a $15,000 proposition to make it uh, something that could actually perform on set with any reliability. Uh, oh yeah, Meg, Meg wanted to know about uh, custom anodized housings because, um, like, for example, we've done the we did the brass dream lens for for Zack Snyder. Um, we did our rainbow pride lens last year, um, and we get a lot of questions about custom finishes. It's not usually something we can accommodate um, simply because if if we were doing custom finishes for everybody nobody would get their lenses in a kind of timely fashion. And it's already a bit of a battle to, to get stuff shipped out um, quickly. So for the most part, we don't do custom finishes. We, we run all of our external components um, in batches. So everything is just on the shelf, black. Um, in many cases, it's pre-engraved so that we can just grab parts and, you know, that, that's a Nikon 24 front, throw it on the housing and, and you know, move as efficiently as possible. Um, it's, it's the odd sort of situation, you know, uh, where, where we can actually sort of like slow things down, you know, take a minute, play with different coatings, finishes, whatever, and, and, uh, and do that for people. So uh, Mark LaFleur, for example, was the first person, uh, Old Task Glass, to bring us the, the idea of the Nikon project. And so for his, we did um, the, the front of the lens where the, the focus witness is, we did that in silver on all of his, but it, it dramatically slowed down the process because we had to get the finish just right where we can do black all day long. There's a, a question from uh, Drew Dawson. Uh, do you know the prices of the Olympus lenses? Um, they're gonna be sort of on the high end of our, our like pricing spectrum. Uh, most of our full frame stuff falls between $4,000 and $6,000. Per focal length, most of the Olympus primes are floating, so they'll they'll lean towards six thousand, um, with the the sort of chunk in the middle being the least expensive because the thirty five, forty, fifty, sixty, and seventy are all single cell focusing, so they'll be about four thousand each. Um, but on either end of the the set, they'll be closer to like fifty five hundred or six thousand. And that's the fee to have a lens rehouse. That doesn't include this donor lens, obviously. And the way That's you right. guys work is you can't just go to your website and order a set of lenses. You have to source the lenses or have somebody source them for you. And then we, they're sent to uh, zero optic for rehousing. Precisely. And, yeah. and when they show up, we'll do a, a full optical inspection. So we'll let you know if there's fungus or anything weird that, that um, might not make them great candidates for rehousing. Um, but once they start the process, we clean every... Uh, every optical surface inside the lens, we put a new circular iris in all of our stuff. Um, so what you end up with is essentially the best version of what you, you brought us. Um, we do optical calibration, so your optics are, are centered. Um, you, you end up with a purpose-built lens, essentially. 
uh, sorry, purpose-built cinema lens versus the, the sort of consumer bubble uh, still photo stuff that it started as. Um, is there a vintage lens set that you haven't rehoused yet that you wish to find? Um, there are a few. There are, uh, ooh. They're, they're mostly like vintage Super 35 primes um, that I'd love to see. Uh, we just got an Astro Berlin 1.8 sent to us yesterday. Um, I'd love to do a whole set of those because they were incredibly fast for their time. Um, they were about the same era as Cooks v. Pancros, original Baltars, but they were uh, f1.8. So they, that's actually, that's what Citizen Kane was shot with. They had a, essentially an early coded version of Astro Berlin's. Um, so those would be a lot of fun. Um, Any other questions? You see any there you want to answer, uh, Alex? Some of them might be a rabbit hole to jump down. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing, talked about T stops, coatings. Uh, the 180 F2 Olympus, are you going to be tackling that one? We are going to be doing that one because I mean, that's, that's such a, a rock star lens. Um, they are extraordinarily difficult to find in good shape um, and, and expensive when you do, but um, I think that's, that lens is one of the reasons. That, that and the 21 is, is why you would get Olympus Primes um, because nobody, and nobody had a, a wide, fast lens like the 21. Um, every other company had like a, a 2.8 Prime that in that neighborhood, either a 19 or a 20. Um, and nobody went as long with, with F2 primes as, as they did. Um, it, was, it goes as long as 250 millimeters, which um, is, is planned to be part of the set as well. A couple more questions here. Uh, what about the Neo Super Baltars? Are you building any of those sets? Um, we aren't really. We're, so we haven't really done Super Baltars on any level. Um, when we started, TLS and, and other companies were already doing Super Baltars. And it was never the intention to just be the North American version of, uh, of TLS. You know, they, they do really good work. We, we have a really good working relationship with them. And so, you know, they had already planted their flag super Baltar wise. It didn't make sense for, for me to spend a lot of time and effort uh, reinventing that particular wheel. So I know they do the, the Neo Super Baltars. Um, Brian Caldwell, who, who uh, is making those lens cells, also does Neo original Baltars, those, those we can accommodate. Let's see, what DNA did you feel FDs share with K35s? The, the 24, the 55, and the 85 are, are the most direct sort of like line between the, the two lens sets. Um, the 35, K35, and the two different 18s are wholly ground up designs. So, um, you know, there, there's something to be said for getting a, a sort of proper 35 set versus FDs. Um, that said, there are a lot of sort of options out there for, for getting an FD set to, to play nicely with K35s, especially with those three four four. Um, can you explain why some of the 1950 and 60 glass had orange discoloration? So, um, a lot of it has to do with the, the glass types um, and, and primarily in the, the really exotic uh, FD primes. For example, like they, they had uh, thorium in the glass that just it ages essentially when it's not exposed to UV light. So what a lot of people are doing to, to fix that, that yellowing is they're building or buying these UV like sterilization uh, cabinets that will essentially clear up the optics 
It's not a service we offer though, because it's something that you have to continually do. That's how you have to essentially store the lens if you're gonna keep it clear of yellowing. And so if we were to say clear up somebody's 55 FD, T-stop it you know, at a really nice like T13, and then they leave it in a case or they, you know, they park it at a rental house and it doesn't go out much or it doesn't get um, exposed to UV light as much as it should, the yellowing will come back and it'll progressively become slower um, and you'll end up with a, a really um, imprecise aperture scale. That's a question about rehousing Zeiss lenses. That, <laughs> Matt, Matt Duclos knows, because uh, we've been inside those. Um, they are tricky and it's something uh, I expect Zeiss has already, already pursued um it's it's a, a, you know we really don't want to spend a lot of time on on lenses that um aren't either unique oh you dropped out again alex you're still frozen that's it you're good so, yeah I dropped out again um, yeah, so we're, we're not really looking at Zeiss Otis lenses for the, the same reason we would do like Milvis or anything like that. I think that's uh, that's likely to uh, to be something Zeiss tackles on their own. Alex, this is the 50 right here. Hey, Zach. Oh, hey. This is my 50. This is the, I, sh I, I use it for my webcam too, this 50. I love that. <laughs> is that the dream lens? Yeah, that's the 50, the rehoused 50. It's this one. This one, sorry, I, my follow focus is broken, so it's that one, but it's also, it's the second one is on my, is on nice. my, right. but yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's, pretty it's, pretty, it's kind of hard to, I have divorced the two. You What's that? On the oh, on the yeah, it's, on, it's on my monstro, so yeah. You're annoyed with me. How quickly does that go? How, can I just go, can I just fob that off and go, oh, fuck it, don't worry, but I'll do that later. You know, I mean, I don't know how to, you know, if you're, I don't want you to be annoyed with me. So I'm immediately trying to fix it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, interpreting it as disappointment is not you fixing it, sweetheart. I don't think we're supposed to be hearing this. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Frankly, I would. Okay, he's muted. I thought it was a question. Yeah. <laughs> it was an answer. But did you show him the, hang on, let me show you the brass one. Yeah, so I, I showed a still from, from pre-aging, but, uh, but yeah, we did a really special finish on the brass version for, for Zach. Here's the brass one, which is pretty, which is pretty sweet. Hang on, let me find the focus. Sorry, it's, I have to keep it dark in here because it's so, I keep it at a 9.5, so it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty, is it reversed? Pretty sweet. Yeah, we did a, a solid brass exterior on that one and then wow. essentially artificially aged it with this really special concoction. Um, so that it looks like it's, you know, 80 years old and, and got dug out of a swamp. Ah. That's a lot of dream lenses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got a whole pile of them. <laughs> All right. That, that, that was a really fun project. And it's actually, um, now, now that we're doing more of that, that line, uh, some of those are gorgeous. Like we, we have the 85 1.5 now uh, from the, the vintage Canon rangefinders. We have the 100 uh, 2.0, um, the 19 is really gorgeous. So that, are all of those mm -hmm. unable to be PL mounted, like the 50? The, um, as you get longer, they, they could theoretically be PL mounted. Um, but because the 50 essentially ruled out PL and the 35 would have been difficult and extremely limited in PL mount um, M or, I mean, we could also put RF mount for like Komodos. We, we could accommodate any mirrorless mount for that, but that, that gives us the broadest freedom to, to get really good close focus and to, and to create a mechanically very robust product. Um, Cause I know like TLS, for example, has done the dream lens in LPL mount. Um, but LPL wouldn't let you go very wide in that set. And, uh, and for example, Whitepoint did PL, a version of PL sort of on, on a dream lens 
Um, but again, it, it sort of, it, it wouldn't work the way we want it to work um, to, to try and shove it into a PL. Got it. Any other questions? That was a super fun lens summit. Thanks so much, everybody, for showing up. If there's any other questions, feel free was, to take your mic up. I was going to offer a comment. Someone mentioned about yellowing of glass. And I know that there were some uh, lenses that had thorium, which is radioactive. I have here a uh, marble that was exposed to gamma radiation and has turned brown from the <laughs> That's it. Where, 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 I'm, I'm curious about how it was exposed to gamma radiation. Well, it was, it was uh, put near a cobalt uh, 60 uh, radioactive source. And, uh, but, but thorium is, is radioactive as well. And if that's in the glass, that will cause it essentially to discolor over a period of time. Uh, the color of the marble itself here can be um, clarified if you expose it to intense UV radiation. So um, that's, that's what I'm saying. We've uh, tried to do that with UV light to get yellowing out of lenses and have not had any luck, but I've heard other, I've heard some rental houses have uh, a safe that they put their lenses in to maintain color temperature of the glass. But, yeah, uh, it, it has to be pretty aggressive and, and pretty consistent. Um, I know it, it, it takes a while to achieve sort of the best results, um, but it, it's something like we've, we've gotten some questions about how sort of dangerous those, those thoriated uh, elements are. They're, it's not the sort of thing where if you're shooting with it, you're going to be exposed to dangerous levels of radiation. You'd pretty much have to grind up the glass and eat it to, to have any problem. Yes. And, and yes. at that point, eating glass is going to be <laughs> the, the worse issue than, than the radiation. Yeah. I don't know if that can be seen. It was, it was from, it was from. Uh, I got this from Hanford, um, Tri Cities in Washington. So, that's that's pretty cool. Have you, have you uh, measured it with a um, Geiger counter? Oh, it wouldn't have any uh, radio. There's no radioactive material in it. It was just glass exposed to uh, radiation, which causes something with the oxygen atoms in the and the glass to uh, shift and that discolors it. Uh, so uh, the glass itself is not radioactive, but uh, if there's thorium involved in the optics, then there is radiation in that. Uh, and, uh, and that uh, over time will cause the glass to discolor. Uh, yeah. Assuming that that is the source of the discoloration and not as, I, as was mentioned earlier, uh, cement uh, deteriorating between elements. Yeah, yeah, because I mean the optical cement used to be made of um, Canadian balsam, which is an organic compound. So it, um, you know, essentially a tree sap. Um, and so that, that is also a, a big cause of fungus in some very old lenses is this organic compound getting exposed to moisture and providing a breeding ground for, for fungus. Um, so places like like Duclos, or, or we've done it as well, um, can separate and re-cement with modern optical compounds, so that it's uh, you don't get the yellowing and you don't have the risk of, of fungus developing either. Well, I know from having made microscope slides in biology class that uh, Canadian balsam was the thing that uh, was placed between the cover slip and the slide, uh, uh, enclosing whatever you were uh, trying to. Uh, uh, put into the slide, so. Yeah, I think it was probably in the, I think it was the 70s or 80s that things shifted from Canadian balsam in, in like photographic lenses to, to more modern compounds. Anyway, okay, that's, that's for it for me. Thanks. Any other questions? So we have more lens summits coming up. Um, we're going to have a couple weeks off here, and then I think I'm going to space them out at least every other week, maybe once a month. We'll see, or every third week. 
as I said at the beginning, we've done about 16 of them, so it's been a long road, but really enjoyable. And we're going to be doing this past the COVID situation that we're all dealing with. Um, but some of the ones that are coming up down the road include PS Technique, um, Crozial, their products, uh, Cine Lenses, the Cine Lenses app, which most of you are familiar with. This guy's out of Portugal. We're going to be doing a lens summit with them, which will be super fun. And then I think uh, Lenswork Rentals. And I'm trying to get Red to do one with uh, the Komodo. I think that'd be a lot of fun to have Red on and take us through uh, the Komodo, their new camera, which is a lot of buzz around that. And then as far as the riots in Portland, we're still open. It's just downtown. Just a couple mm -hmm. blocks downtown is where the big issues are. So. Uh, in Portland, we're open. In Seattle, we're open and we're running and things are getting busier. So I hope everybody stays safe out there and, and um, we'll get, get to the other side of this hopefully sooner than later. Thank you so much for having us. You bet. It was fun. Thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. Thank you.